Good morning, good morning. I guess technically. It's like Ross East Coasters, right? <laughs> So we just have a few more minutes. Welcome, welcome. We are going to start at one o'clock for our 2005 What's New webinar. I have posted the um, webinar blog post. We have the agenda attached in there. <clears throat> oh. Wow, Charles, that is ded dedication, a 3 a.m. Zoom call all the way from Japan. That is aggressively morning. Well, welcome for joining us. No, that's not how sentences work. Thank you for joining us. This bodes well, everybody. I have high linguistic faculty for this uh, webinar. Jesse, I got word that YouTube Live is up. Yes, I just said hello to everyone. We have Sam Passy is watching live. Hi, Sam. Awesome, awesome. Everybody who's here in the Zoom, we, we have 50 slots to go before we're full. But if we fill up and you have any coworkers who can't get into the Zoom, yeah, do know that they can go watch us on YouTube Live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Jesse will be helping us today and moderating any chat that goes on in YouTube. So we're eternally grateful for our forever and ever education um, person that will never leave our team. We're leaving. Good. <laughs> I would say we could wait a minute or two more, even though it is one o'clock. I don't want to waste anybody's time. I'm going to get rid of my dog. It is sometimes hard to call de tell dedication from foolhardiness. <laughs> we'll call it dedication. It sounds nicer. And we can't see you. So it's not like you even needed to leave your bed or get out of your pajamas. I thought our COACON presentation at like 10 o'clock was late, Jesse, didn't you? 10 p.m. Yeah, I yeah. can't imagine 3 a.m. Oh, wow. Oh, that's okay. Good to hear, George. Oh, this is a fair time to mention. Um, if you're in the Zoom chat, it's going to default to only sending your chat to all panelists, which means Kelly, Jesse, and I will see it and nobody else will. So. <laughs> I'm realizing right now, we've all been responding to things in chat that you all can't see. So we sound, you know, a, a little deranged. So feel free to change your Zoom chat to, to all panelists and attendees. But to, to catch everybody up, George is wearing a suit and Charles Kelly is calling in from 3 a.m. in Japan. <laughs> That's everything. Well, 60 degrees and sunny today in Huntsville. It's probably 40 here. And we're about the same over mm -hmm. in Iowa. The sun is out though, which is yes. nice. We got our first yes. actual snow the other day. No. Well, I, I don't know. Does it count as actual snow? It fell, it was in the air, and then it melted on the ground. I don't <laughs> know if that counts. Yeah, it depends on your opinion. Okay, well, it's a little after one. I have no problem starting. We are recording this. Oh my goodness, 94 degrees. Oh my goodness, 50, 47 in New Hampshire. We're going from extremes here. I wonder what it is in Japan. Um, I have no problem starting. Oh, 
somebody joined from YouTube because he felt left out. Was there only one person? Oh my goodness. Got to start spreading the word. We will start our upgrade webinar. As I said, I put a link and I'll do it one more time because if you join late, you don't see any of the chat. This link, and I'll share my screen if you all don't mind at this point. This. So this um, blog post has where you probably found to register for this What's New webinar. It also gives you dates for our Q&A in a couple of weeks and our second What's New. I want to direct you to the agenda for our What's New, so we'll follow that. Breaking out some of those key components in the different modules throughout um, the 2005 release notes. We are not going to cover them all. That would probably be hours and hours of time that you would have to watch us. Um, but we have gone ahead and broken out the upgrade notes into modules like we did in 1911. So in our upgrade note blog post, let me take a copy of that and send it along. This actually gives you a lot of resource for 2005 um, documentation from the Koha community. We have a lot of our tutorial videos and blog posts listed here. So we have broken out quite a few of those features and enhancements already and have documentation. And then we have module specific blog posts where we talk about more of those um, up things to look forward to, to um, see the the um, different areas of Koha. Oh, I need to change the access link to my PDF. I apologize, Tammy. Give me one second. Okay, let me update that really quickly. As Andrew was saying, if you do have any questions or you want to chat with us during this, there is a chat box. Make sure it is meant it is to all participants and um, panelists so everyone can see it so we don't look deranged, as Andrew said earlier. We also have a Q&A box. Um, so either way that you want to ask us questions, please feel free to do that and we will be happy to answer any questions. Of course, if we you bring up some great questions during these, if there is anything that we can't answer during this, we will go ahead and um, get back to you. And we will also have a Q and A um, blog post that will cover all the questions and answers, whether we were able to answer them or not during our presentation. So welcome, welcome. I think I have resolved the link agenda, but if you cannot do it, please let me know. And there's one more snafu, I guess, and I'll fix that in a second, so I apologize. Okay, maybe. So we are going to stop, oh, and actually let's, should we go ahead and introduce ourselves? Maybe somebody doesn't know who we are. Um, again, my name is Kelly. I'm one of the educators with Bywater Solutions, and we are here to present you some 2005 features. My name is Jesse Zaro, and I am one of the marketing and outreach coordinators here, and I also do some of the training and education here. Mm -hmm. And I'm Andrew Firsty Henry. I'm also one of the educators here. And uh, yeah, um, that, that's all you said. I feel like I should say more, like one more thing. We always do a fun fact or something. Oh, oh Andrew, um, you start with your fun fact. Oh, no, it's not there. <laughs> Sorry. Brain's too full. I'm too excited about all the cool things in 2005. 
Um, okay, well, let, let's jump into that. If you if you all are ready, I've put the agenda into the chat, so you don't have to go to the blog post. We'll fix the other um, URL link. And there has been an update to when we are going to be releasing our 2005 upgrades to our partners. So if you want, are one of our partners and are just anxious to know when we're going to upgrade your system, we are looking at upgrading in January. Uh, we have had to push that back a bit as we are doing infrastructure improvements for our partners in through the month of December. So looking forward to January. We are all looking forward to 2021. So this is this will be a great start to 2021, don't you all think? Okay, perfect. So the first, we're gonna start with the OPAC and public service section. The first thing that I wanna talk about is the ability on the OPAC to send a problem report. So report a problem on your OPAC as a patron. So this is super exciting. Let me pop over to the OPAC. From any page on your OPAC, your users will find the option to report a problem. So even if they were in a bib record of any kind, that report a problem is going to show up on their page and they are able to click that report a problem and once they are logged in, so they do need to log in to do this. If they are not logged in, Koha will prompt them to log in. The problem can be sent to two different email addresses. Koha has identified them as the librarian. So that would be the branch email or the Koha administrator email. So the Koha admin email. The problem itself will appear for the user and it will be pushed over to the staff side. So this is saying that the patron had an issue on this bib number and the user can go ahead and put a subject like help, I can't access this record. And then once they submit that error report, it will be sent to the library. So that is super, super helpful. I think that a lot of um, patrons would appreciate to be able to say that. And also sometimes we forget to pop over to the OPAC and maybe don't realize it's down. So this will be really helpful. This was a very old bug. And I know we talked about this when we were doing like a live Koha documentation. Um, so this is bug 4461, so super, super old. So let's pop over to the staff client. Um, there were As a with, couple of questions. Oh, while, while oh sorry. Here. Yeah, uh, in the yeah. chat, uh, Charles asked, will the patron get a copy of the report? They do not automatically, do they? They no. do. Oh, they do, okay. Mm -hmm. I forgot, that one does email to them. Mm -hmm. um, Anita asked, the problem found link relates to the page they submit the problem on. Yeah, that's correct. It's gonna give mm -hmm. the URL for the page you were on. And then Ed says, so it will only be sent via the two emails? Correct. And there is the email, but then there's also the thing Kelly's going to show you. Yeah, so it is going to go to the email, but like so many things that are done on the OPAC and submitted to the library, it will appear on your staff client on the bottom. So you can see OPAC problem reports. So it's kind of the same structure as we've seen a lot of different areas of Koha. We like almost like those checkout notes. This is what it reminds me of. I can see any of the report problems that have been submitted and not viewed. So let me move my face a little bit over here. So the one I just sent was this one, help, I can't access this record. That is the entire URL for the staff to be able to see. It tells me where the email was sent, but I can also see it on here. This is a link to the patron that sent the error report. And then I can go ahead and mark it viewed and or mark it closed. You can see we've been testing this a lot so we can see lots of problems. This is a staff permission to be able to see the problem report. The staff permission is OPAC problem report management.
to enable this, we also have a system preference. So this is not automatically turned on your system. You will need to turn this on. This system preference is called OPAC report problem. So here it says allow, or it will be set to don't allow as the default to allow patrons to submit problems for OPAC pages to the library of the COHA administrator. And it says you do need to have the COHA admin email address enabled. Marty asked in chat if there are plans to make a similar feature for the staff side to use to report problems. I haven't seen any such uh, bug, but it would be a reasonable one to file. I mean, if this structure already exists, it seems like it'd be not too hard to also make it happen on the staff side. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then it would stop all those phone calls probably to the directors at home <laughs> to say, I can't get to something. What do I do? Um, to note, there is a patron tutorial that has been created if you wanted to share that to your patrons on how to use this feature. So that is a YouTube video that you're more than welcome to share with your patrons. Okay. We got through all the questions. Good, good, good. Another feature that has been added to the OPAC is there is a new link under the search bar called libraries, or if you are a single branch, it will say library. This link will access all your library information that is found in the libraries in your admin. So where you fill out your name, your address, your fax number, your phone number, all of that will appear here and all your branches will appear in this list. Super helpful. You also, if once they have a big list, a user can actually click into a library specific information and get, I know, do you love this? And get that OPAC info box and I'll show you that on the library on the staff side. So it further expands what they see once they click that library specific link. And then I have the ability to toggle to the others if I wanted to. I didn't make those as pretty, but I can click over. So again, this is a, bringing a, a library link under the search bar to populate that information from your staff clients. So let me pop over to your our staff client. And as I said, it's under admin and that's under library. So under your basic parameters where you have your library information, it will populate your address. And then let me go ahead and edit this. So you can see the distinction where my little pretty video is. So this OPAC information will appear once the user has clicked the actual name of your library. So you can have fun with it. Look at this. Is this like reading rainbow, I think? Like dancing in the, the halls. You see the little rainbow at the bottom. Dancing in the stacks of the library. This um, of course, oh, go ahead, Andrew. Azusana asked if, there, if we can choose which libraries or branches show up. Not yet. They're easy to hide any individual one with mm -hmm. jQuery, but yeah, that's a, a logical follow-up because yeah, I know uh, Utah Valley like many of our partners has some branches that are more sort of internal. Absolutely, like technical services or storage or just things that they don't actually need the users to see. If this is not something you wanna see at all and that library link could be easily hidden also. Um, how do I got to this page? Absolutely, I think this is the page. If I'm at home, this is under the admin. So our COHA administration and this is under libraries. So this is where you put all your library information, which populates into your notices and slips, and now also populates into your OPAC. So there you go. It even takes emojis. Did you see that, Andrew? Emojis are fun. <laughs> this last one for the OPAC is something that I'm really happy for and I appreciate the person that took my dream and moved it forward and I think it was Owen that did this. You now have the ability as a patron to rate 
items that you have checked out. So if your library is using star ratings in the OPAC, we've always had the ability to um, rate items in the catalog. So as you're searching, um, I can go ahead and click a book and give it a star rating here. That rating can be seen by anybody. But I thought, how great would it be is if you could rate something that you have checked out. So you've already finished the book, it's amazing, and you wanna rate it that way versus doing it when you're browsing. So this new feature, once I go to my account as a patron, I can now go ahead and rate something that is currently checked out to me and say, yep, this was a five-star book and I can go ahead and push that through. How exciting is that? We have an, uh, a more general question that uh, T from Galveston asked in the Q&A. Oh, and Jesse already answered her directly, but um, she asked if everybody, if they will get automatically upgraded to 2005. Everybody will be upgraded to 2005. We don't have a firm date yet, um, but you'll be notified well in advance of that date. And when the upgrade itself happens, there's, there's nothing in particular you need to do. Overnight, we'll upgrade you. In the morning, you need to clear your browser cache. And yes, George asked the question, can you do this from your reading history tab? You can. So what you have checked out, you can rate. And from your reading history tab, you can also go ahead and rate. Princess Protection Program, five stars all the way. So again, this may not be something that your library is using currently. And if there's something that you've never known that this existed, this is a system preference that you can turn on to allow for star ratings. And I'll pop over there. I think it's called star ratings. Oh, there's a lot of things that have star in them and it does not. There it was, OPEC star ratings. Did I go too fast? There it is. OPAC star ratings, show star ratings on, and you actually have the ability to determine where they're um, showing. So results, detail, and user, only details or no. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something that's very anonymous. It's kind of like Goodreads star rating where you can see five people have rated this and the average rate is 3.2 stars. Okay, any other questions about the OPAC and public services? Okay, we are going to head over to Patrons and Circ. The first one on our agenda is add a point of sale function. How amazing is this? How many times have you gone into a library and just because there was a book sale, like so you're traveling, remember traveling, remember vacations, um, where they're selling used books or they're selling friends of the library merchandise. So this allows libraries to be able to track payments not connected to patron accounts in Koha. So it has a, it has a very unique title because it's called add a point of sale function to allow anonymous patrons. So really in, in essence, it's saying the ability to track payments that are not connected to Koha patrons. So sometimes when you want to manually invoice a patron, copier fees or for a charger, you can do it right through their account or a new card. Um, this is now you are able to set up a point of sale function in your system to track those outside of Koha accounts. Oh wait, when there is one more question about the star ratings. Is there a way to get a report on what books have been rated? Yep, oh. there's, a, there's a table called ratings. So yeah, you can run a report against that. Awesome. Thanks Andrew. 
Okay, so a few things that need to be done to start to use the point of sale functionality in Koha once you get upgraded to 2005. There are two different system preferences. And actually the first one that we're gonna focus on is just using the point of sale. So pretty sure that's just called point of sale. So enable point of sale. So that needs to be turned on. And it also tells you in this system preference that you need to have cash registers set up. So this was a feature back in 1911 that was introduced. We have a great handy blog post on how to set up cash registers already. And I've linked the point of sale blog post and that cash register blog post. So if you are really excited about point of sale and weren't really excited about cash registers, now go learn about cash registers so you can set up your point of sale. But to use the point of sale, you need to tell Koha what cash register you're using. Um, Andrew, Jesse, and I talked about this this morning, and really, if it's not something you're using a cash register per se, but you just need to have the ability to say, this money was taken here. Um, so even if you set up just one to be able to use that. However, cash registers have a lot of functionality to have more than one per branch, have a default one. Um, so you have a lot of functionality that way. Okay, so let's just pop over to our other system preference use cash registers. So make sure that is turned on as well. Now, once that is done and you have set up cash registers, I will pop over there really quickly so you can see that. That is under the admin page under the accounting. So you can see I have some cash registers set up. I have, let me just see what branch I'm at, I'm at the main branch. I have two set up at the main branch. I have one set up at the east and one set up at the north branch. And I have this button up here that I can go ahead and create a new cash register for another branch or a third one for my main branch. I have ability to add a name, description, what library it lives at, if it's default, so what it, it, which will be picked automatically on the drop-down menu and the amount of money in the drawer when you start. So that's your initial float. I've never heard of it called float before, but um, in Koha it's called float. So point of sale, cash register, easy peasy, right? We're, you're there with me. The next thing we have to do, lots of steps, is let me go back to my admin. We're still under the accounting section. We have debit types. Debit types prior to 2005, prior to point of sale, were any of the things that you could manually invoice a patron. So copier fees, new cards, things like that. Now you can add more debit types to allocate them as a point of sale transaction and or a invoicing to the patron. So you can see here, I added a book bag. So um, if you are selling those beautiful like canvas bags with your logo on them, there's a description how much that bag is. So when you charge somebody, Kohan knows how much it is. And if it's available to sell, so using the point of sale or to invoice a patron. So I mark this as both. So if Andrew came to my library off the street, he doesn't have a card. I can bill him through my point of sale transaction. If Jessie is a patron at my library, I could bill her through her patron account. So I have that option for both. If you didn't want to do it for both and you really just wanted to keep these two separate, you can mark any debit, code, debit types as only to be sold. And that would be only available through that point of sale feature. So here's that form on how to create a new debit type. Library limitation. So now we're ready to sell some things. Wouldn't it be exciting? Oh, Christmas ornaments or something like that. Can you imagine? It'd be so much fun. Okay. The point of sale module will show up in your more drop-down menu. So you have your point of sale feature. 
as well as you get a, no, a whole new button now, point of sale right here. If I go to the point of sale, I have the ability to start a transaction. So I could say I'm selling a book back to somebody. Once I click add, it will go over to my sale area. And if that's all that that person bought, I can't believe it, they didn't buy five of them or something, I can collect the $20. I have that functionality that I have in the accounting part of the patron form that I could um, say that they gave me a 50 and how much I'm gonna give back to that patron. So it does the math for me. And then the way that they paid. If I pick something outside of the cash, then it's not going to show up in my, you know, like my totals when I want to cash out at the end. Um, what cash register I am taking this money in. So I'm going to default to main library register one. Get a nice little pop up, make sure I give money. Do you want to stop me, Andrew? Um, Bridget just asked, uh, they don't sell items and she's wondering if they can turn off point of sale. And yeah, if you flip off that initial system preference that says point of sale, not enabled, then you won't see any of it. It'll just all disappear on you. I get a nice little sound and I can print a receipt. This is creating a new receipt in your system called receipt. So under notices and slips, you'll have a new receipt. And I can go ahead and make that a little bit bigger so you can see my library name, my transaction payment, what I sold. And there we go. I can give it a receipt to the patron. This is fantastic. Don't you guys think? Yeah. Okay. They're nodding. It's wonderful. We had comments in uh, YouTube about buying Friends of the Library merchandise and swag. So absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, maybe you're having a cheese sale, right, Andrew? A little cheese yeah. sale. <laughs> so again, this does have a little bit of setup. You have to have a couple of system preferences, a couple cash registers, or at least one cash register, but you have the ability to not have to charge patron accounts when you make sale. And this is a great way to track that sale through Koha. Sue asked if there is a way to integrate Koha with a credit card vendor. Yes and no. Um, there are a variety of different vendors that we either have plugins we can turn on to make Koha talk to a separate cre credit card processing service, or there, there are also a variety that will process a payment online and talk to Koha via SIP. Um, it never fully pulls that credit card processing into Koha, uh, just because Koha does not want to touch the sort of security concerns around being a credit card processor. But there are, are lots of ways to get Koha to, ex to accept credit card payments, record that that payment happened. I will, I will, once I link to this, I'll link to a blog post about e-commerce in Koha in a second. So we do have a blog post that sums up what Andrew just said very well. Okay, the next one I wanted to talk about goes hand in hand with the point of sale system. And that is the library cash workflow, library cash up workflow. So at the end of the day, balancing out your drawer in your cash register and going back to that initial float. Oh, that's a good, somebody asked a good question before I go on. Is Can there a way to cancel or reverse a point of sale payment? You should go on because the button to do that is on okay. the next screen you're about to show. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is exciting. So over on the left, we have some options um, specific to point of sale and also heading over to both the cash registers and configuring items. So I really like that flexibility that I have to go back to admin to find these. I have those options on the left, but what I'm going to do is go to my register details. So I'm able to see transactions that happened through that cash register. So the cash register I used, 
main library register one. It tells me when the last time I balanced my cash register, what my float was, how much I brought in in sales, how much I set out in sales, like what if I refunded any money, and how much I should go ahead and pull from my drawer. And as um, somebody asked, here you go. So I could go ahead and issue a refund to the person if they decided they sadly did not want to buy my library book bag. I know. You can go ahead and issue that refund, how much I'm going to return to the patron, how I'm going to give it back to them. Let's go ahead and refund that money, sadly. Now my transaction details have revised. It says that I actually took in $40, but then I gave out $20 and now I should be able to just pull that $20, bring me back to my float of 10. I really like the ability to print any receipts that I need to um, during this cash up if I forgot it or if I needed a second copy for my records. And then my last option would be, hey, go ahead and cash up your system. So it says, hey, don't forget, take that $20 out and you will be starting ready for the next day of $10. And there we go, I'm back to my beginning. So both of these work really well together and I love to see kind of a huge vision from one bug and capturing a second one to make this a really seamless operation for those libraries that want to do this. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? Are we like, raise your hand or give us a woohoo if you're ready to turn that on when you go live in January. There, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure somebody's dancing with joy. Now, see, aha, I knew someone would ask that one. I was waiting. Um, <laughs> so Lynn asked, what tables would be related to transactions for reports? Um, everything you sell and every payment you, you receive, those all go into the account lines table along with all the like fines and fees for patrons. So it's all together in, in one place there. It's just your point of sale stuff isn't tied to a specific borrower. Also, there is a new cash register actions table that records each time you cash up, when it happened, who did it, and what the, the net change to the drawer was. Ooh. I just maybe found it like two minutes ago. I, I hadn't realized it was in there. Oh, cool. So maybe we'll add some reports or some starter reports to that yeah. blog post in the next day or so, so people can be ready for the ability to do that. So as Andrew said, these are like a book sale or a book bag um, charge will still be in the account lines under that debit code, whatever you named it, book bag or book sale. Okay, there I'm talking about, I think one more before I pass the mic over. The last one that I'm going to talk to you about is the ability to brace yourself people, brace yourself. The ability, allowing your patrons the ability to, when, I can't even say the words because I'm thinking of the best way to say it. When somebody renews an item in the OPAC or in the staff client, to be able to stop that pain, that accruing fine at that point. So the system preference, I'm gonna start with the system preference so everyone can visually see this with me together. This system preference is not turned on by default. It is called the new accruing item when paid. Renew accruing item in OPAC. If a patron pays off all fines on an overdue item that is accruing in the OPAC via a payment plugin. So if you um, paid it through PayPal, then go ahead and renew that item automatically. 
Now the other system preference, renew accruing item when paid. So if a patron pays a accruing fine in the staff client, so comes up to the desk and wants to give you money, then the item will be automatically renewed for the patron. This is actually probably something that will be really helpful to libraries, kind of takes one step out of it. So I'm paying my fine and that item can be renewed. Note, there is your renewal period base that will come into play. And I, I appreciate the um, note in the system preference to make everybody remember to look there. So it really depends on your renewal period base, whether this item will actually get a future date or still be overdue. So let's pop over to that system preference. So when renewing borrowers base, when renewing, sorry, wrong one. When renewing checkouts, base the new due date on today's checkout, today's date, or the old due date of the checkout. Man, my family has had some serious conversations about this at some holiday dinners, is what's fair and what's not fair. It's amazing what people want to complain to you about libraries when they get you in a, in a room. Um, so this really depends on what you have set. So if you understand that correctly, if I am paying a very old item and it renews, but it's based on the old due date, I only get so many days more and I may still be overdue. So right now I have it set at the current date. So if I were to pay a um, accruing fine on my account, Koha is going to renew it based on today's date, not the old due date. George and Marty asked the big questions. George asked, what if the item has a hold on it? Oh, yes. And I do believe that will block the renewal. Mm -hmm. uh, and Marty asked, will this work if we have auto renewals turned on? Uh, and I believe it will still renew if you have auto renew turned on but not if the renewal is blocked by the no renewal before value in your system or in your circ rules. Um, I'm gonna double check that one because I am less certain about how this is gonna interact with auto renewal. Um, and this is a fine time to mention. All these questions are gonna go on the upgrade blog post. So we'll gather these all up with definitive answers, particularly for something like this where I'm a little bit less sure. <laughs> oh, we're all head scratchy about opting out of auto renewal. It's just one more complication. Thank you, Andrew. I was trying to place this on hold. So I, if I had an item, okay, there we go. So I have a book checked out, Zombies Don't Play Soccer, The Adventures of the Bailey School Kids. And if I attempt to pay my accruing fine, and let's see what Koha does because it's on hold for somebody. Pay this fine. Ooh, and get a nice little yellow pop up. The fines were paid off. The renewal results are displayed below but it was not renewed because it's on hold for another patron. So my transaction is gone. My fine has been paid off, but um, I can't actually renew it. So it is still checked out to me. So I would then need to check it in. So probably I wouldn't even take payment on an accruing fine if it was on hold at the staff client because you're gonna to have to go through that one step also. These are both set to disabled. So you would have to go in and turn them on if this is something that your library wants to use. Definitely not something that you probably need to turn on if you are not taking payments through the OPAC. So if you're not having a PayPal um, payment 
option on your OPAC, you would probably not need to turn on the OPEC, but for the staff clients, it would be something that you could decide to turn on. And we'll find more out about your auto renewal question because that's a good question. And that makes it my turn. All right. <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen. And I'm actually going to jump over here. My uh, first one here is. This is a long bug title, bear with me. Lost items that are checked out are always returned even when attempting to renew them. So that relates to this system preference. Our favorite, mark lost items as returned. So this is one that makes a really big difference in how lost items behave in your system. So, some of you are going to see something here that's a little different from what your system does, but this system preference asks, when I mark something lost, should it continue to be considered checked out to the patron? Um, the system preference has existed for a while. There's a new value in here now, and it's this last one, when receiving payment for the item. So how this has worked thus far has been if we don't check any of these values, when we mark something lost, the patron is charged and the item still counts as checked out to them. So it still shows in their checkouts, it counts against checkout limits. And then as soon as that lost fee hits $0 outstanding, so whether that's because they paid it off or it was written off, or I guess they returned the item and they got a refund, as soon as that happens, the item is removed from their checkouts. It's marked as returned. Some libraries wanted to have the option of paying that fine off or that fee off and having the item stay checked out to the patron. So I pay off my lost fee and I'm just sort of back to having a regular checkout. So now we have this last option when receiving payment for the item. This will be turned on by default for everybody because having this checked maintains the, the previous Koha behavior. But if you want to turn it off, you can come here, uncheck that box, save your CERC preferences. Now, let me jump over to my patron here who has checked out a book. I'm going to real quick bop over here and mark that book lost. My mouse is being funny on me. There we go. So now my patron owes us some money and here's my lost item. It's continuing to show as checked out. If I jump down to accounting and I write that fine off, previously this would have caused the item to stop being checked out to my patron. But because I changed that system preference, it is still checked out to them. It's still in their checkouts. It's still lost. I haven't marked it found, but my patron no longer owes us any money. It's still on their account. So we're still sort of remembering this item was last tied to Pearl here and she needs to find it or we need to remove it. It's not just automatically wiping it off her account. I'm curious to see how many people make this change. It's a pretty fundamental change to how Koha thinks about stuff. So I'm, I'm curious to see how it all plays out. And I lost my chat when I started sharing my screen. So now I'm looking to see if there are any questions. There aren't yeah. any questions, Andrew, but I've thought of a use case scenario, but it's a very off use case. Because if I, one of my children lost the book, we charge for it, we found it, but the child still hasn't read it for school. So we need to actually continue to have it checked yeah. out to be like, oh, now we actually found it. Now we need to read it. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe. maybe. Listen, I always like features where I'm not immediately sure what the need is, but like someone mm -hmm. asked for it. Someone thought this was really important. So I'm, I'm excited to see how libraries use it. It's a fun new tool. Mm -hmm. Speaking of fun new tools, 
my next one is actually sponsored by one of our partners, our friends at the Vermont Organization of Koha Automated Libraries, which, yeah, I, I only ever call them Vocal. So I forget that like that stands for something, but thanks Vocal. Oh no, now four new messages popped up. <laughs> uh, Marty asked, does it clear the law status? No, oh, I'm not even going back far enough. George asked, I have a cron job running that marks an item as lost and removes it from the patron's checkouts when they are 45 days overdue. Does this affect that cron? Uh, no, your cron that is marking those things is returned. It's really um, this option in the sysbref from the long overdue cron job. So if your cron is marking them returned when they go lost, then they're already returned and, and this is irrelevant. Uh, yeah, Marty asked if it clears the law status and it does not. As Usaina asked, if you click claim, will it charge the patron again? No, because they've already been charged for this item. Um, yeah, then Marty asked, or yeah, it just removes the on loan. Doop, doop, doop. George says, I, I just went too fast. He was still typing his question, which is fair. Uh, and then Marty said, if I recall correctly, there is a bug to add claims returned to this system preference, this mark lost is returned. And yes, don't off the top of my head remember where that bug is in its life cycle. But there, it is a thing that's being worked on. I can look for that as we continue on. This system preference is, yeah, it's one of those very deep ones that does engender a lot of questions. All right, I'm gonna close that one. Yeah, I don't need to, I can just leave, thank you. And come over here to library groups. So this is bug 22284, sponsored by Vocal. And it is add the ability to define groups of locations for hold pickup. So we have several different flavors of group already. We already had groups to limit patron data, OPAC search groups and staff search groups. Now we have local hold groups. We've set up a couple here. We've got a hold group for the East and Main Library and a hold group for the North and West Library. So this is saying these couple libraries out of our whole system, these couple share holds in a way the rest of the system doesn't. So from here, I can go to my circ rules and see, I go to standard rules for all libraries. I have some new options in this part of my circ rules, my hold policy. Previously, I could say from any library, from the items home library, from the patrons home library. Now I can say from a local hold group. So instead of saying, you can only get stuff from your library or from all the libraries. We can kind of, yeah, define a subset. So that means, coming over here, I've got an item or a bib with four items, one from each of my branches. I've got one at East and these other three aren't showing, I can make them show me. And then these are each from Maine Northwest. If I go to place a hold on here, for my example patron who, I, yeah, lives at the East Branch, it's going to allow me to place holds on, no, I'm sorry, my patron lives at the West Branch, on items from North or West because those are the hold group that my patron is in, but not from Maine or East because those are outside my hold group. So yeah, we've got lots of partners that are large groups of libraries where there are, yeah, subsets within them that really do handle holds differently. And this is gonna be a great help in making those circles function the way you want them to function. Andrew, we have a question that came in on YouTube about the, um, the refund for lost items. And they asked, does this then change the behavior of a long lost item magically showing up years later and being checked in and creating a credit for a patron if it comes back, let's say, you know, a year or two later? It does not. This really does not touch whether or not an item generates a refund. It's all about whether or not that item is 
considered to have been checked in. Thank you. Sure. Anything else about hold groups? Now, let's see, I'm waiting in case George is typing a very complicated and important question. I think or I anyone. know a lot of <laughs> George. Is I know a complicated question. <laughs> so I'm just going to vamp. I like hold groups, I'm excited think... about it. I think it will, a lot of libraries will like this and embrace this functionality and it will be helpful to their patrons. George asked, will the hold groups affect the local holds priority system preference? I'm trying to remember how those interact. Um, so local holds priority asks, as I'm filling holds, should I make sure to give holds you know, if somebody from the main library has a hold on a main library item, do they get it before somebody from the East Branch? Um, and there is nothing in here about hold groups. So this hold groups have not yet made their way into the system preference. That's a logical next step in this whole thing. Yeah, as George says, he wants the third dropdown to include matches the hold group. And that would make total sense. I'm gonna make a note to file that bug because that's a really good question. Um, and then Diana asked a question, actually going back to point of sale, do we need to input bank accounts for uh, point of sale payments? And no, Koha really does not, is not like an accounting or, or cash register software in that sense. It's not linking up to your bank. It's just sort of keeping track for you of, this is what I sold, this is how much money I took in, this is what I expect to be in the till. Okay, well then I'm gonna stop sharing so Jesse can talk about a few things. Okay, and just as we're talking and everyone's listening, we had a question on YouTube live about the uh, holds administration when you're setting those up for the first time and you will start in administration and library groups. And we do have a blog post that I've shared on YouTube live and Kelly or Andrew, maybe you can share that one too in the chat link um, that outlines walking through setting it up in administration. And then again, of course, in um, your circulation and fine rules. So the next three options that I'm going to talk about will hopefully help speed up your steps when you are creating patrons in the system and then when you're doing some searches. So the first new system preference that I'm going to talk about is called Collapse Fields Patron Add Form. We love system preference names. So this allows us to now customize which fields are collapsed when you're creating a new patron in the patrons module. So before we could use the borrower unwanted fields if we wanted to hide some. But you know, you sometimes have options when you're creating a patron where maybe you want the alternate address available, but you don't wanna see it. You know, if you have, let's say, um, temporary residents that may come south for the winter and then go north um, back at the summertime and maybe you want to add in an alternate address. This actually allows you to have those collapsed. So you'll see here I have alternate address and contact and patron accounts and patroning, patron messaging preferences collapsed by default. So now when I go into the patrons module and I select a new category that I want to create, you'll notice right up top, it will tell me show collapsed fields. If I scroll down, there's that alternate address and alternate contact. I can just click on that and that will open it up. Or I can select this box up top and that will open all of those fields for me. But just a nice way to kind of speed up the process if you want those there, but want to make that form condensed, that allows you to um, you know, set that up. So this is, yes, and George says that replaces a huge chunk of jQuery. Yes, this will make things a lot easier. The second system preference that I want to talk to you about is the pre-fill 
guarantee field. So for those of you that use the guarantee, guarantor relationship in Koha, whether you're connecting um, family members, guardians, aunts or uncles, partners, whatever it may be, this allows you to set up a pre-filled form when you create that guarantee in the system. So prior to this, there was fields that were hard-coded in, so it would automatically copy them over. Now you have the opportunity to select which fields are pre-filled when you're creating that guarantee. So I have 13 out of 32 selected. You'll notice there's a pretty long list here that you can select from. If you wanna cop over, cop, copy over alternative um, address or contact information, right now I have it copying all the main address information and all the contact information. So now when we go into patrons, I'm going to grab um, a, a patron here and we will add in a um, guarantee. So Laura Ingalls Wilder, let's add her daughter Rose in. We're going to come into add guarantee. And when we select that, you'll notice that it then copies in all of the addresses that we've selected. So the main address, any of the contact information, hopefully making that process a little bit faster for you when you're creating that information. So it gives you a little customization um, in that patron form. The last one we're gonna show you for uh, patrons and circulation is in the item search. So you know uh, the item search is one of our favorite search <laughs> options here. And from the staff client in our top menu, this will allow you to essentially do that item search. So if we click that search drop down menu and we click on item search, that will take us in where we can run a report. You can do so many great things here. Um, it will provide a list for you. And when you're scrolling through, you can kind of narrow down what you're looking for. So in today's uh, example, I'm gonna grab, let's see, let's grab young adult information. Let's say I wanted to make some modifications. Of course, I can drill down even further by collection code or a specific lost value. If I was looking for certain call numbers um, as, as a longer um, parameter, I can enter those in. And of course, at the bottom, I can narrow by screen, CSV, um, or barcode. Screen will take me to the next page, or I can directly download a CSV file or a barcode file. Once I search, that will bring back my results. And the big one here is now we'll see checkboxes over here on the left-hand side. And this is a great way, instead of exporting everything, now you can select what you want to export. So you can see here, maybe I want to grab just these four that have a similar title and I want to make some changes to those. You'll notice now for my export selected, it only has those four selected from uh, this option. So I can now export this as a CSV file or as a barcodes file. And if I select that, that will then export those um, four barcodes into a text file. I can take that into batch item modification or batch item deletion, whatever you were moving forward with. So just another great option with the item search. Okay, I'm gonna now pass it back over to move on to technical services. And we had a handful of questions in the Q&A that Kelly and I were both poking. So let me just make sure we got all of them. Um, Bridget asked for some more information about law statuses generally. I put a Monday Minutes in the Zoom chat about law statuses, but law stuff is always a, like a big kettle of fish. So if you really want to go over all the bells and whistles, um, you might consider opening up a ticket. I also put a few more in the, I think she asked the same question in the Q and A. So I think I've put at least four links in the Q and A of more lost status information. Okay. And Dinah asked, um, related to the point of sale system, how they would receive the monies for payments that are processed through point of sale. Anything that you're not just taking the money right there physically, you know, as a cash or a check, Koha really does not handle 
how you get that money. If you're taking a credit card payment, that you would be processing, processing that payment through something other than Koha, even if that feeds the, the details of that payment back into Koha, like PayPal or whatever it is you're using to actually process the payment would handle getting that money to you. That's just well outside the scope of what Koha handles. I think that was everything. Well, and and Diana asked generally about patron reporting and yeah, we could follow up on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary asked, is there a post or video about using the barcode file for batch modifying? Not yes. now, but could use a refresher. Yeah. We'll grab one. All right, so moving on to tech services. I'm sure it was a Monday Minutes, Jesse. What do you think? That sounds like a Monday Minutes. <laughs> All right, let me share my screen again. And so the first thing in tech services I want to talk about is a bug that I'm like irrationally excited about. This is a change to the item call number system preference. So when you add a new item to a bib record in Koha, the item call number system preference tells Koha which mark field to look in to find the call number to copy into the item record. Previously, this could only take one mark field. So you had to say, all right, I'm always going to take the call number out of the 082 or the 050 or what have you. And it just doesn't broadly work for libraries. There are just too many exceptions where maybe in this case, I want to use a different call number. The one I run into over and over again are like public libraries that are Dewey libraries, but only for nonfiction. Fiction gets an entirely different call number. It's, you know, FIC and then the author's name. So the, this sysprev now lets us define multiple mark fields and it will go through them one by one. So as we're set right now, when I make a new item, it's gonna look at the 092 A and B. If it finds a value there, it'll put it into the item. But if it doesn't find anything there, it'll check next on the 082 and then the 050. So if I go to cataloging, I'm going to grab a new record. Today is Diane Duane Day in my life. So we're going to use her as examples for everything. And I can see, uh, I don't want that one. So I'm just looking for something that mi is missing the mark fields I want it to be missing. Oh, that's a beautiful one. I'm going to grab this record. And we can see if we scroll down, this has an 082 of FIC 20, whatever that means. And so it will use that call number rather than the 050. And there is no 092 at all, so it's going to use this one. But if I really wanted, for some goofy reason, to say, eh, let's make this one Library of Congress instead. If I just take that mark field out, it'll fall, fail all the way back to the 050, and that's what will be put on my items. Now, I didn't turn on the 092 field in my default framework, so I don't have a way to just stick one in here. But if I wanted, if I had that on, I could just say, oh, ignore the 082. I'm going to put my local call number into the 092, and we'll just use that instead. So really nice functionality for libraries that have some difference between different types of material and how they assign call numbers. Just grabbing my chat back here. Uh, the next one on my list, I'm actually going to stay right here in this mark record for and scroll back up here to my 003 which you can see is marked, oops, I'm trying to zoom in on that, there we go, is marked important. This is a new option in your mark frameworks. Previously, we only had sort of two speeds for mark tags. Either it's wholly optional or it's required. And if it's required, it has to have something or you cannot save the record. Now, thanks to bug 8643, for any given mark field, and here's my default framework set up for the 003, we can flag that as important rather than mandatory. And important means I get a note here 
And when I try to save that record, hold on, I hit the mandatory step first. Do, do, do. Sure, you're a book. And my 003 is empty, which means when I go to save, it tells me your 003 is important. Are you sure you want to save without a value? And in this case, it's going to let me say, yeah, I know, normally I want an 003, but not this time. Don't worry about it. I'm going to save my record anyway. So a really nice sort of middle ground for this is mostly a thing you want, but not always. Uh, Mary asked, can you control what that error message says? I'm sure you can. There's not a like place in the system preferences to just provide alternate wording, but I'm sure we could swap wording in with jQuery on that. I think this will be really helpful for anyone who's learning to catalog in Koha yeah. as to be able to add some of these fields to be like, hey, these are the few fields that we find are important to make sure when you copy catalog, they're filled in. I think that would be really helpful. Oh, Jeff suggested a comparable thing for patron records to say, this is an important field for my patron record. And that, yeah, is, is also mm. a good idea. Make a note. All right, one more cataloging thing here. And that is gonna be, clean up my mess a little bit. And go back to cataloging and to the advanced editor. This is one I'm really excited about. This is a change to macros in the advanced cataloging editor. So previously, this was here, ta-da. One was able to create macros to do things like put in all your RDA fields. But those macros were always stored in the browser cache, which had several drawbacks. I mean, first off, that meant they were always unique to, to a specific user and to a specific computer. So like if I had all my great macros at my desk, when I went out to work a shift at the reference desk, none of my macros were there. Second, that also meant that every time I cleared my browser cache, those macros were all lost. And remember, we kind of you know, ask you all to clear your browser cache every time you upgrade Koha, so it happens. Well, this bug, uh, do, 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 17268, has moved those macros actually into the Koha database. So now they are stored in Koha. They are not lost when you clear your browser cache. They are accessible from any computer you're at. And also, they can be marked as public so that any user who has access to public shared macros can use them. So I created this RDA books macro. And anybody who logs into Koha who has access to the advanced editor and macros can run that macro. And then when I make a new one, I already had one called test, test two. As soon as I make that, I can flag that as public or not. If I don't check the little box, it's unique to me. If I check the little public box, everybody can use it. Uh, there is a permission related to that. A couple, actually. Can I create shared macros? Can I delete shared macros? So this is a really nice change. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think macros are a thing a lot of users have held back on because there was that added complication of, well, they might get deleted. Now that, yeah, a little more usable there. I'm excited about it. <laughs> George says new permissions are almost as exciting as new system preferences. I'll admit, permissions do tend to be a thing that can sometimes be an afterthought in new developments. And so it's nice when, when somebody hits those marks right up front. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed a question about uh, do, 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 important yeah, fields in the advanced editor. And no, they, the advanced editor do, do, does not know if a field is marked as important. So like right here, I don't have an 003 in this record. Bah, 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 I'm just gonna put some values in here so it will let me try to save this. It's mad about other things because I've made a terrible mark record, but it doesn't care that I don't have an 003. The advanced editor really assumes uh, 
a bit more knowledge of what your, your high points are. And, okay, moving away from cataloging over to purchase suggestions. Close that, yeah, I don't care. The new, uh, new system preference here. This is actually sponsored by the Round Rock Public Library, so thank you, Round Rock. This is allowing us to define a total number of suggestions allowed in a time period. So previously we had a, a way to say you can only have so many open purchase suggestions at a time. This is a bit more blunt than that, I think, a little more just sort of straightforward. How many suggestions can I submit in a number of days? I've got this set super restrictive right now, so it's easy to show you. Patrons are allowed one suggestion every one day. But if you wanted to say 10 in a month, 10 in 30 days, or however you would like to set that, that means I go over to my OPAC. I'm logged in as my pretend patron. It's my dog, technically speaking. Uh, and then I can go new purchase suggestion. And blah, 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 blah. That's my book. It's a great book. You should all read it. And I can submit one. As soon as I have submitted one, instead of getting a link to, to submit another one, I get a little note that says, you may only add up to one suggestion in one days. That's a nice minor bug to file there. Maybe make that S go away or at least put it in parentheses. Um, th and this is nicely comprehensive. Um, if you saw me real quick copy paste the URL, if I try to cheat, and sneak up on that, add a new purchase suggestion. It is smart enough to say, no, no, no. You can't, just because you bookmarked the page, I'm not gonna let you cheat. So nice, straightforward limit for yeah, a question folks have asked several, you know, many times over the years of really how else can I limit purchase suggestions? And I should find that same patron over here. And on the staff side, I get to break that rule. This is a, an OPAC side limit. All right, my next one is about searching and cataloging actions. This is add batch operations to staff interface catalog search results, bug 23349. Uh, this is one that Kelly and Jay-Z already did a, um, a Monday Minutes for. And it's a nice one. Um, I'm gonna do a search for Batman. And when I land here, so this looks familiar, nothing has changed here really, but I've got a new little button, this little edit button right here. If I pick some options out of my search results, my edit button lights up and lets me batch edit these titles, batch delete these titles, or merge these records. Yeah, merge is great. The merge is the one I'm most excited about. Previously, merge was like the one thing I ever told people to go over to cataloging and use the cataloging search for, which is fine, it, it, it works. It just was sort of, I don't like having to say, go to this other place that you don't ever go to. So I love that now you can just do this straight from here. Oh, it gets a little confused when you back up though. Hold on, boop. So if I take those and I say merge, kicks me over here. Same as if I'd done that cataloging search and worked from there. So just dead simple, give you a few fewer clicks to solidify stuff together. <laughs> Sam says one merge to rule them all. See, you know, see that would be a trick. It's, we've all we've read Lord of the Rings. Once you start talking about one thing to rule them all, it's bad news. All right, my next one is over in serials. It's a special love letter to um, all the law libraries out there. 
or the academics that are hold, holding strong with their, their print serials. Um, I'm gonna jump into library journal and I'm gonna go over to serial collection. This is where we can see all the issues we have for this serial going you know, back through time. So we don't have a ton here. We just have, uh, what's that? Seven that we received this year, but lots of partners, lots of libraries that use serials heavily you know, you're receiving those monthly issues through the year. And then at the end of the year, you take those 12 issues and you bind them together and you make them their own bib and you don't want these serials issues anymore. Now we can batch delete them. Previously, you had to delete each one individually. Now I can come here, check all the ones I want to check, click delete. And it's going to delete those serial issues and also give me the option from here of, if I've got item records tied to those issues, delete those items as well. So making it real slick and easy to do all of those in one batch. Yeah, for, for folks who do a lot of serials, th this is gonna be a big time saver. And I'm excited about it. See, Mary's, Mary's excited. Then my last one, tech services. I got a lot of pretty old bugs pushed this round, which I'm super excited about. And you look at that agenda and you see a bug with a four digit number. That means it's, it's something that's been sort of hanging around Koha for a while waiting to get developed. So I'm excited to see these happening. And this next one is over in labels. So I'm gonna go to tools, label creator. Uh, this is bug 7468, add label to batch by barcode range. So now, you know, previously I would go, I would make a label batch and I would say, I want these specific items, print me some labels for them. Now I have the option instead to, instead of making a batch, pick barcode range. And it says, okay, what barcodes do you want? How about... I don't know, however many that is to that oh, plus 15. I print that. I say, yep, yep. These are barcodes, barcode, barcode. I'm starting at position one, sure. And that makes me a sheet of barcodes. Now, what's exciting about this is I didn't make those item records. I didn't have to fiddle around with cataloging anything. It is just make me some barcodes. So I could print these stickers off, have them ready to go. And then as I catalog stuff later, take the barcodes off my sheet, put them on my items. I don't have to worry about getting all those numbers into Koha and then creating a label batch to get them back out. I can just make a sheet of barcodes, which is just that easy. It's exciting. This can also point at actual records in your catalog. If you've got things that exist already, if these were barcodes that were in use, it would connect up to those, but it doesn't need to. It can just make some barcodes. And that is the last of my tech services things. Let's sort of bounce up and down in place for a second in case somebody's typing a question. We do have one from YouTube. Do oh. macros still only add fields and not delete any? Oh, I think they can oh, delete fields. Yeah. They can definitely delete fields. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I can, I, I have to figure out where I saw that. I can't remember if it's in the wiki. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. There it is. Perfect. Yeah. So here's an example to just delete the 942. Delete. Okay. Perfect. Um, I'll put this. Well, that won't help. I'm going to put it in the Zoom chat, but that won't help the YouTube. I'll yeah. type it in the YouTube too. Thanks. Okay. Well, and then we've got a few left in admin and Kelly's going to take us home. Um, yeah, this is exciting. You guys, we, we've kept the same amount of people. This is great. So we have three more and you are good. You are ready to jump into more when you get into our blog post. So this is exciting. The first one I want to talk to you about is the ability to search and install plugins right from the staff 
client. If anyone is familiar with plugins um, and you have plugins installed on your Koha system, those can be found in the Koha administration module under plugins. Plugins are sort of just a kind of a separate program that can be run into Koha, but are not completely co like cohesive into Koha. If that's the best way to say it, I'm not sure. I'm not one of those developer kind of people, but we now have the ability to go ahead and search the plugins that are available to bring into our system right from the staff client. Previously, you would have to go to our GitHub site and find the plugin over there, download it to your computer and then upload it into your staff client. So this is taking away a lot of those extra steps. Once I'm on this plugin page, I can go ahead and I see all the plugins I have installed here. Now I can go ahead and search for plugins. And I have some plugin choices. If I wanted to see more information about any of these, I can see when I hover on them, I have a link to the GitHub, but I can certainly go ahead and open that up into another page, read a little bit about the documentation that is about that plugin. But if I'm pretty sure this is the one that I want to do, I can easily go ahead and install that right to my system. So it's super amazing. We, if you are not familiar with plugins, we do have some documentation in existence and we can certainly link those um, if you've never played around with this area, but this is really fun to find out also what is out there and available. The one thing I would like to say about this feature is that we also got rid of a system preference in 2005 called use Koha plugins. Prior to 2005, you had to actually turn the system preference on, use Koha plugins to be able to see plugins and download plugins into your system. That system preference has been removed and you just go ahead and install things into your system. So that's pretty exciting. Another huge change in 2005 is where display-ish customizations of your OPAC live in Koha. So let me pop over to my, going all over the place. George had one more plug-in question. Oh, yeah. He asks, where is the offsite database of Koha plugins? What is this searching? Oh. I believe our offsite database is GitHub, Bywater Solutions. And this is searching Bywater plugins for Bywater partners. And I think we can, oh, go ahead, Andrew. I was yeah, gonna say, we, we could add other things. Yeah. <laughs> I think we put Tomas's in there too. Sorry, yeah. Andrew. Okay. So in sync. <laughs> um, but yeah, that goes into a config file on your server. If there are other GitHub repositories you would like included in your site, let us know and we can add those in. Sorry, I'm all over the place. I couldn't find my OPAC tab, so I'm just opening a new one. Another big change that is coming in 2005 is where the customizations of the OPAC live. Prior to 2005, to customize the OPAC nav right, the OPAC bottom, the OPAC searches, the OPAC header, all lived in the system preferences and HTML was installed right into the system preference. Now, Koha has moved over quite a few of the system preferences and I will think it will continue um, into 2011. Sorry, I went to the wrong area to continue to send that over to the tools, the news feature. So if I head over to the news feature, this is something that was always available to use that would drive what is found on your staff clients and having that news area on the OPAC. This 
functionality has expanded like exponentially that would allow you to be able to create um, customizations outside of the system preferences and not have to know HTML in a lot of cases. So this is really user-friendly how it's been created. We have a lot more areas within the display location that you can say, I want to add some details to my main user block, which is generally where a lot of libraries use the cover flow or my OPAC credits, which is down at the bottom or my OPAC login instructions. So I have lots of different areas. Once I say that's where I want it to live, I can go ahead and um, define the, um, the WYSIWYG. My WYSIWYG looks a little funny right now, though I wanna say, I'm not sure why, but it shouldn't look like this. There's a system preference that controls that. Is there? Yeah. And maybe it's turned off, okay. The WYSIWYG system preference? Uh, yes, yes. You see. I've forgotten what our, our um, system preference total has crept up to with this release, but it's growing ever higher. I think 711. Oh yeah, that's what you want. 711, that's it? I think, I think that's what Donna said. Sounds right. I feel like it's higher. Oh, there we go. That's what I know. That's what I know and love. Um, so you can add a title when you want it to publish, when you want it to expire, where it lives, in what position, and then you have the ability to do that without knowing a lot of coding um, in this WYSIWYG. And I guess what I said that wrong, and I'm probably saying it wrong again. I was told I was saying it wrong in another Monday minute, so I apologize. Um, Lucas, we've had a lot of early adopters that have already gone to 2005 as they continue to test. I, this is the first time we're shouting out to them. So thank you, thank you for anyone who has let us upgrade you early to test this out. But anything that is living in your system preferences that's controlling your header, your logos, all those color customizations or anything that will has smoothly moved over to the news feature and is beautifully um, editable there. So that's really fun. Um, question, is there a bug to break this out from the standard news? I haven't seen that bug, but back on that news page, there are some simple uh, filters. So you can search you here. Okay. Or, and on the left, you can filter by display location. Display location. Lucas filed a bug, um, and I believe it is patched and it's coming where some of the images are coming over very large and filling this screen up. So he, and I'll find the bug in a second, he has created a bug to have this display not show automatically, but have a preview button. So you've created it. And then if you wanna look at it versus it sh everything showing, because that could become a very long list of items. I believe it was your system. I noticed it in. Yes, George. Knuckles had huge icons and they were filling the screen. You couldn't even really search very well. So that I believe that has been patched and is coming soon. Another last thing. We have no more questions. This is huge. I, I don't know if anyone is unfamiliar with column configuration. And if you are unfamiliar, please familiar, familiarize it with your current system and know that it's getting better in 2005. In the administration module, there is the option to what's known as configure columns, and that's under additional parameters. This is the ability to configure what is displayed on your staff client and in your OPAC. And there's lots of different column settings per module, acquisition settings, OPAC, course reserves. The biggest one has just come in 2005, the ability to customize your item holding area. And you saw 
Andrew mess around with it when he was checking something out where I'd hidden a lot of columns. So I apologize to him. Um, but within the, there it is, the catalog section. So you can see we have catalog and cataloging. So I was like, I'm not sure if I'm picking the right one. You have holdings tables and you have other holdings tables for the libraries that use those two different tabs. So you're, the branch you're logged into and all the other holdings, that's the distinction between these two. But you can go ahead and hide the item type, the holding branch, the home branch, any of these if you didn't want them to be seen. A lot of libraries have jQuery hiding some of this stuff right now. So we have the power back into your hands to be able to manipulate this. If it is hiding, by default, you can go ahead and unclick it. The one thing I would like to note about this, your home branch also stores your shelving location. So if you were to hide anything, maybe don't hide your home branch because those are linked together. And if you hide your home branch, you will also hide your shelving location. So let's see, we had hidden collection code, item call number and status. That seems dangerous, doesn't it? You pop over to an item. There's my zombies. So this screen is where we are customizing that um, configuration. So I actually do not see collection code, status, and I can't remember the other one. I can easily at any point see what I'm hiding here. And for the time being, I can go ahead and say, show me all of those and actually see them. But those column configurations is by default. So exciting. This is 100% really cool. And this is not the only table that got added to column configuration in this mm -hmm. upgrade. It's just the one we were most excited about. Um, if you look on Kelly's screen where she's got those little Oops. columns and export buttons, my, my rule of thumb, I keep repeating it, people, is if you see those buttons, this table is in column configuration. So you know you can go over to admin and control which columns you have there by default. I definitely know course reserves and how it's displayed in the OPAC is another area column configuration got um, added to in 2005 as well. So super exciting. Um, there was a question about the font change. Has there been a font change? And maybe she's talking, maybe um, Master Zane is talking about in the news. I believe you were in news when she asked. Yeah. You. I yeah, don't know that. if there was a font change, but I know there's been a general trend to change how we build buttons throughout Koha, and that might be the, the, the change. Interesting. That is. We are a few minutes over 2.30, so I apologize, but uh, I'm, we'd be open to any questions anyone has that we have not addressed, or if you have any thoughts about anything that we, I can stop share while we talk, but I can certainly go back to sharing the screen. There were a questions? couple more questions in okay, the good. chat. Um, Charles asked, says, I didn't quite understand the remark about OPEC customization and migration. Did you say that the customization will automatically migrate into the tools from admin? And yeah, whatever you've got in like that OPEC credits, SysPref will pull over into a new news item. Yep. There was one more in there, I think. Did the column changes show universally or just by workstation and user? When you set column configuration in the admin section, that is for the whole staff interface. That is for everybody. If you use those little spoky wheel things, on a specific page that is for your workstation right then. Laurel's excited about getting back to binding cereals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Little things in life. If you know somebody who would benefit watching this What's New, we have another one later this week. So please pass it along that you can certainly still register or we're also doing another YouTube live so we can enhance our viewership and we will have this recorded and we'll work on our questions and answer answers for you all.
Thank you for spending time with us. This is yeah. so fun. We so love fun. it. So fun. I want to say Andrew's list was like three things before I was like, no, that's fun. And so he's, his list got bigger and bigger. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you so everybody. much. Oh, question. Oh, uh, yeah, Bridget asked, are we able to rewatch certain sections of the presentation? Um, the whole recording will be on our blog and also on YouTube. So it won't be broken out into chunks, but yeah, you can go in there and jump to whichever bit you want to see. Just hook us up to your big comp TV, sit in your bed, eat some popcorn and watch us all over again. And we do have a lot of like specific for the ones that we showed you, there's either a blog post or a video or both for each of the specific ones that we've showed. So there's a accompanying uh, blog post attached yeah. to each of those. And maybe more Monday minutes to come. For sure. For sure. <laughs> we, we love upgrade season. <laughs> I know. <laughs> maybe Andrew will come back on to join us. Mm. I think he's been on the most. Well, I'm winning. <laughs> we can coordinate our earrings. Donna usually coordinates a color. We mm -hmm. wore purple last mm -hmm. time she was on. Yep, yep. Purple, purple. Okay, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.